sound based music sound based music uh, is a wide area. I always keep telling other people we've got a niche area here because we don't have a music department. But within our niche, we have a wide area, as I think John will demonstrate very quickly. Thanks, Lee. I was recently asked to be interviewed and filmed in my studio. And one of my heroes, uh, Bernard Parmigiani, there he is, sat in his studio. Um, but I kind of had a bit of a crisis because I don't, I don't really have a studio, you see. <laughs> <laughs> this is my studio. <laughs> Since, uh, for the last 20 years, I've uh, shut the studio door and worked primarily with materials uh, outside of the studio. And this is what it looks like in some of these cupboards. Uh, it might seem a little bit chaotic, but each one of these boxes is important, hence the title of this talk. So I rather embarrassingly took some photographs of my studio and sent it to the uh, production company <laughs> and thought, well, oh well, maybe we'll find a studio somewhere and we can film me. <laughs> but it, it kind of left me thinking deeply about this. It was a revelation in many ways, a reminder of how my practice is not um, centralised in many ways. These boxes also, as, as well as being practical, uh, because I would literally take music to a community or to a space, very much like the um, main theme of this conference. It, all, it was all about bringing something to somewhere else. And each of these cupboards, in many ways, was a, a, a kind of memoir of these trips. In some of these boxes were remains of projects. Uh, it, they were kind of like an archive. Uh, but also, uh, this kind of metaphor, they actually seemed to be more like a metaphor to me of how I was taking my music out, outside of the institution beyond somewhere else. I suppose you could call my work um, uh, very much reflective of the post-digital era. And when I would take these uh, boxes out, I would then uh, do events. Again, I would not call myself necessarily a community artist. This was very much my practice. So I would take out my cardboard boxes, and to begin with, there were kind of these meeting events that took place and people would make things. I was very much interested in uh, um, engaging, like I said, with materials. I, I, I called this uh, dirty electronics, partly because in English we have this saying, to get your hands dirty. It, in many ways, it was a rejection of a kind of virtual, virtual reality and uh, everything digital. Uh, as Laurie Anderson said, there's not enough dirt in virtual reality. <laughs> and I wanted to engage in this kind of practice. It also meant a number of other things, but I won't go into in great detail here. Uh, for example, not recording material. I was <coughs> primarily interested in a live practice. Uh, and not necessarily working with computers. Face-to-face uh, -face is a bit of a buzzword, that. But I, it was very much about meeting people. Uh, and this, this is uh, some examples of my work. Um, in many, in lots of different places. Uh, it, it wasn't necessarily about being kind of like a missionary, as if I was spreading the word of contemporary music. That, that was not the case. I only went out on these trips for my own benefit primarily, to learn from other people, or to, simply because I enjoyed it. It wasn't as if I wanted to spread the word. It was simply for my, my joy or benefit for going out and meeting uh, such communities. I like to think of myself as a bit of a, a guest in that regard, rather than me taking out um, some kind of doctrine which I hope people would adopt. So a lot, I was fortunate enough to be invited to lots of different places uh, all around Europe and America and China and, uh, and in lots of different spaces as well. 
Sometimes in academia, yes, but at other times in some clubs or bars or cafes, complete mixture of, of spaces. Uh, and there would always be a big focus on performance <laughs> of some kind. So it wasn't just about a maker's club or a hacking club or a fab lab. Because I trained as a, if I can say that, as a musician, I am a musician, you can get that to that subject in a minute, <laughs> not a composer. Um, I was very interested in, in um, performance with musical outcomes. So I won't go into too much detail about that. That's a little bit about the past. Well, and maybe the present. So back to the boxes. So here are all these boxes. Uh, so it's these boxes, um, there's a little bit of something more conceptual here, essentially set up this uh, polar concept, I suppose we could call it. This uh, dichotomy between something centralised, which the studio somehow to be symbolised, versus something that was more decentralised. These things have already been touched on to a certain extent uh, over, this last, over the weekend. Uh, Susanna was talking about this in terms of uh, sound and music wanting to um, have things that were community driven rather than from an institution in that regard. And um, I'd also, at this particular uh, time, I, I'd been a guest at the Royal College of Art, working in information experience design and interaction design there. And I was introduced to Anthony Dunn, who is a design um, theorist. And his, uh, his writings, I suppose, have inspired me. This particular book um, has some very interesting ideas, particularly which would also seem relevant to my practice. Towards the end of this book, there's a, a, a section on um, post-optimal technological objects. Post-optimal. Ashley Dunn argues that many designers, particularly of technology or technological objects, need to think more than just about optimization and upgrading and this kind of constantly increasing power, those sorts of issues, and think beyond that to more poetic issues and about an experience with something. Now, Dunn ties in with um, this whole kind of movement, the slow movement. It's about quality of life rather than a fit, you know, something that's easy and something that uh, it just happens to be there. In fact, um, on Saturday mornings, this is where I normally am, in fact. This is Ned Ludd Close. Uh, Ned Ludd uh, was the, his name is given to the Luddite movement. I don't know if anybody knows about the Luddite <laughs> movement. And uh, he is a, either a local hero or villain. Uh, so I, I will be taking my daughters to their singing lessons at this moment on uh, Ned Ludd Close. And similarly, this kind of ne there's a neo-Luddite movement about quality of things, about maybe doing things slower. So I was very interested in the work of Anthony Dunn. And this also brings me to another book by Anthony Dunn and Fiona Ratby, which is called Speculative Everything. What I particularly like about this is that they throw up some of these uh, polar concepts simply as a method for challenging perhaps themselves as well. And there's quite a few Greek people in this room, but this, this, is, this type of um, rhetoric, if you like, or debating is, you could argue, age old. I think certainly Aristotle and Plato also, this dialectic model where you throw up you know, your two sides of the argument. And uh, Aristotle, I think, will argue that through doing this, we can help become clearer in our own practice. So similarly, I'm going, I'm going back to my cupboard here. This may, I do have some sounds in these boxes. But I, I want to go back to my cupboard, and I suddenly find myself in this centralised, decentralised polar concept. And I'm thinking about actually done here. Now, I, I, I must confess, um, I did really come to some of these ideas through uh, the classics, Certainly through my experience of playing some of the, always um, playing some of the Fluxus pieces. This is Waterjam by George Brett. And we have a similar sort of, it's more rather than opposites, perhaps juxtaposition of uh, polar concepts in many ways. Bach, Brazil, or 
dance music, gunshot. So I was already working with these pieces within my own performance work and similarly being exposed to uh, Anthony Dunn's ideas, the way in which he put together <coughs> book, speculative, speculative everything, um, were kind of influencing me. I, I did an event in Norway where I did a project where I worked with some polar concepts, but I also thought it would be good to try and apply this to my, um, my own practice, but also the, the theme of this conference. So uh, last night, when I got back from the pub, and after Susanna's talk, uh, I was thinking, yeah, well, let's start with the first one I've got on my list. I can't go through all of these now, because we've probably run out of time. And actually, most of these things on this list, at some stage or another, I've e either writ written about or created pieces about, one or, one or the other. These, all of these things are really important to me in different ways. Uh, and it, in, in many ways, um, emphasizes this, the theme of this conference, and about how, I suppose you could say it's a way of developing a philosophy about uh, taking music out and beyond. Uh, so let's just, let's just have a quick, uh, let's have fun and just go over a couple of these. Uh, That's, well, to teach or to learn is quite an interest, interesting one in that uh, I also did a Music Maze. Nancy Evans was here yesterday uh, and uh, Duncan Chapman and I went to Birmingham Conservatoire, uh, Birmingham Contemporary Music uh, to do a, a, a workshop and uh, I think I came with some grand composition ideas but after a while I think that again the children in that group wanted simply to make their own composition. So this, to learn, I think in this context is me, rather than me being the teacher. So again, I, I, I can present these two polar concepts. Similarly, composing and devising, I was talking to Neil about this um, the other day. I, when I became a doctor of philosophy in composition, I decided not to call myself a composer. 20 years ago, the word composer is loaded absolutely loaded. If you type what does a musician look like into Google, you get a very different uh, picture. Or what does a DJ look like into Google? I have, even though some of my colleagues are having a discussion with Lee about this, I was taught by composers, I have a PhD in composition, but I've worked extremely hard in not calling myself a composer for the last 20 years because we get back into the same old argument time and time again. So if I can put up these um, poem concepts, it makes me think about which side of the coin am I on here. Similarly with comp a composer and performer, uh, I could talk about that one for a long time. I was uh, completely sh shaken, I suppose, by an interview with uh, Harrison Burtwood's whistle in the 1980s, Paul Griffiths, a well-known author, and uh, he did an interview with Bert Whistle. And Bert Whistle sold his clarinets so that he could become a composer. <laughs> and, well, I was just a student at the time, and I read this, and uh, it kept, coming, kept haunting me, this, why do you sell his clarinets? <laughs> and I, what you can sometimes get to is what's called a synthesis. So you start off with a thesis, I suppose, in this case, the composer. You could argue the performer is the antithesis, and then, Ultimately, then, you could be left with a synthesis, something different, you know, the, the, the mixture of these two, the opposite, two opposites. Uh, and I ultimately have stuck for something relatively conservative in that I generally term, call myself a, a musician, even though that word isn't particularly uh, original, but it's a resynthesis of the, the idea of musician for me. And I was talking to Lee in the, in, in, over, over coffee about how some of, uh, some of the PhD students who, who have come here have had different synthesis. So like um, Manolis Manusakis, who was a PhD student here, uh, he came in as a composer and he went out as a meta producer. We had Steve Jones yesterday. He came in as a musician, I think, and went out as a convergent media artist. We had a fantastic talk from um, Switzerland yesterday. And we had Composer Plus, 
Again, it's another type of synthesis beyond just the composer. So I'm also quite interested in, in the synthesis sometimes you get from these two polar concepts. And it doesn't, you might in the end, not just that, oh, well, maybe I am a composer, and I just stick to one side. And then I started having a little bit of fun down the end here. Um, uh, yeah, note, sound. Uh, uh, as well as being called a composer, I'm often called a noise musician, which that, that's also upsets me a little bit, because <laughs> I, I find that an oxymoron, because to me, it's music. It might sound like noise to other people, but it's music. Mm -hmm. Noise. Uh, it's like a, what's, what is it, a f like a weed, a flower in the wrong place, growing in the wrong place. <laughs> it's subjective to me, noise. I like those sounds. And I'm just sort of playing with some of these ideas. I mean, I, I'm probably running out of time. Can you but, uh, yeah. <laughs> so I have to do that. Yay. Anyway, so from this, um, I'm trying to set up the, the, it's, the some of these ideas. I also think that my uh, practice of making also offers this the potential to be radical. That sounds a little bit audacious, um, but simply thinking of this as from the root, then it's of course that is possible. I can go out with something back to my polar concepts that it isn't made. So I have I think. I think uh, um, to make or to mend or to uh, or whole or part. I often go out with parts back to my cupboards again. They're not necessarily instruments in those cupboards. Uh, they're there to be instruments. They are parts, things that can be arranged in different ways, things that can be made from the beginning, from a root. So I feel that it is possible, not that I would uh, um, be as bold to say that some of the music has been radical, but there is potential to be radical. This is the, the point I want to try and make with all this, and why uh, I've not been too scared but to, to use this word and to think about this word in this particular con context. Okay, uh, so maybe I should go on now and just talk a little bit about some of these things in practice. I do have the advantage of doing a uh, Unled workshop later on, uh, where I can play some of the some of the um, more practical things from the work that I've done. I've got a couple of boxes here, but I'd just like to talk about now the interfaces uh, project. So I've been um, uh, doing some of this work, and uh, I suppose as my practice, and the interface project has brought me into I, I would say a more direct kind of community arts arena again. Um, and I've been fortunate enough to work with Duncan Chapman a, a great deal on this, along with Jim Fries. A and I um, like to kind of put put the word music first. This is something that my colleagues and I would we talk about this a lot. Do we put a comma after music? Is it going to be music? Is it going to be sound? Uh, and but like this idea. I also had adult and child, I think, in my uh, polar concept. And I have this maxim, you know, if it's good for a child, it's good for an adult. I think, um, um, Han, you were talking about this yesterday, do adults do some of these workshops? So I've, I've tried to create a kind of, um, uh, I won't call it curriculum, so we say content that is actually um, neither for children nor adults or adults, uh, and the, the word, the, the music is a, is a very uh, important aspect of build, building some kind of projects based on working with raw materials. Um, I think that's, a, that's another thing that, that fascinates me, it's not just about the technology, it's, it's also about um, finding sounds, in many ways it's very cagey and I can take an object or some kind of circuit and you could say that's an extension of a kind of Cajun philosophy where you then go on and find the music in those materials. So the title um, for these workshops is Music for DIY Electronics. Um, recently I put together a 30 page document, there are about 10 projects which you can access now on the um, um, DMU uh, interface, I'll just quickly show this. Uh, um, so this is uh, 
And in fact, the introduction is was one of the hardest things I've ever mm. written. Mm. If you want to just get a quick and uh, easy um, understanding of uh, some of my work, I think this, this sums it up. This went back and forth many times with Lee, who I thank enormously for helping me with this, and Duncan, of course. So uh, uh, the, the, the collection of pieces our, um, or projects is a joint effort with, along with Duncan and Jim Fries, but, but um, the conclusion here I've written. And, uh, and I also thought about this kind of structure in a more cyclic way, and, and not particularly rooted to curriculum, because the interface project is not about one particular curriculum. This has to go out beyond to other countries, to Greece, for example, in a couple of weeks' time, I'm going to be working there at the analysis, taking some of these ideas to a different different country to who maybe have a different curriculum. Like I said, I'm not interested in curriculum. If it's good for children, it's good for adults. So this is uh, um, something you can have a look at. And also to conclude, I've got the Lee Landy two minute call. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, is that going to go to the right page? No. Okay, get that. Uh, I've also separated this out with a, a, what I call a, an alternative type of publication, which is um, sort of more like a fanzine. I decided to put together some of the actual pieces, uh, so the, the actual project that you can, where you can build some of these uh, instruments or sound devices are online. But go, uh, running alongside that, I've been working with an illustrator who has um, uh, hand-drawn some, uh, I won't call, call them scores, instructions, or um, they can often look like this. Uh, Natalie K. Thatcher is her name. Uh, and um, I've been also fortunate to work with uh, Pauline Oliveros, who's written a piece for some of these objects and the Howard Skempton and a number of other really interesting artists. Uh, so there'll be a very short little pamphlet um, just with ideas about music making. And, and in many ways, my last couple of slides tie, tied back to the uh, music for young, uh, young performers that uh, Duncan showed earlier and how both he and I have discussed some of these ideas about how he might present some of these um, musical ideas beyond. Um, so I've run out of time and if you want to hear or play any of these things later on, uh, then I'll get some stuff. You'll open the bar. Yeah, <laughs> you can. I'll open the box later. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. So I think in John's case, you should give the answer, and he'll work on the question. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody have a question to ask to John? Well, me again. <laughs> um, I I like especially like something you said um, about the boxes that they are those are to be instruments, you know. So like this potential you carry in the box because I think this connects to something I often find myself um, in between, and that is what is creativity. And we talk a lot about it. We want the children to be creative, um, and I think in some way you know what is that really? I mean, I bring you know, uh, hardware hacking stuff or maker stuff, would I be okay if they throw it against the wall, for example, you know? No, actually I want them to make noise or music, whatever. So um, I think I find myself often asking myself like, um, what, what aesthetical suitcase do I give to them? I think also with the software. Um, and where does, where does creativity or creation really start? And how much, because I think a lot of, they can be creative with a lot of things. They don't, they don't necessarily need electronic music for that, I would say. Yes, I, uh, this idea of, so the example I gave where I went to Birmingham <coughs> and um, I, try, I think I, I tried to explain some kind of grand concept for a composition, I used the word. So I, I became, look, in that moment I was my old self, I, was, I felt like a composer trying to get some of the children to play a piece. 
But it was obvious that they were just excited and wanted to make some sounds. And so that, in that moment, my judgment was, let's let them just go off and compose independently. There are, have been other times, I can remember asking a rhetorical question for, to a student, and I said, what do you think about, you know, how can we change this uh, sound to something else? And they replied, oh, I don't know, you're the teacher, you tell me. <laughs> so uh, they, I, I've sometimes realised that you do have to lead. You know, there are times when they're looking to you to give some guidance. And it, 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 I find that is the art, I suppose, of being in that position where you let... You, I don't think either one is going to work. You need to be able to just decide at what point... Where do you intervene? What, uh, where, where, is, where do you stand back? I think the word facilitation is about enabling. And sometimes in the act of enabling, some leading is necessary. Or some gesture is necessary. And when you get in a situation like that, uh, well, perhaps. Not you must, but well, perhaps. Well, what do you think? And I think that's what facilitation is all about. And everything we've been talking about today has been about facilitation. That's how it ends. Yeah, I think that, sorry to go that, I think that facilitation is closely related to the act of the compo of composer. Yeah. Actually, you facilitate how an object changes in time. This is what composition is, right? I suppose. <laughs> or this is what music is, something changes over time and space. So, in, in a sense, for being a facilitator is actually being a composer as well. I think the only reason... That's an idea. I, I, I think the only... I, 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 there's no doubt about it that in many ways I am a composer. The only reason I don't use it is because of the baggage. Yeah. Uh, the, the, I don't the, use that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> didn't you? Yeah. It's not that I don't believe in composition. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's politically charged. Definitely. Any right. other questions? Yes. Yeah, well, I, I'm not sure if I've misunderstood it, but the binary opposites and kind of yes. placing yourself with one or the other. And, uh, I, yeah, I'm just really intrigued by that. So I guess my two questions are, are they, is it like yin and yang? Is it something that sort of changes and you might sort of reposition yourself? I think, I think uh, you can, you can, I think as a rhetorical device, it's, um, meant to help you try and position yourself of where you are. Yeah. I don't think you have to take one, one or, there is a continuum yeah. in some cases. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think it's just a pro your own provocation. Yeah. Uh, just, just to put yourself in that position, um, rather than having to adopt one or the other necessarily. Yeah. You should also, because one of your uh, pairs with DIY and DIT, and I don't think everybody knows what DIT means. Yeah, so that's well, just... Put it together. Yes. Yeah, so that, again, I, I know. so I've been often associated as somebody who works in, in, the, in the world of DIY, but ultimately I've ended up at DIT, DIT doing it together. Which is a common theme that's coming out of this day. So uh, again, I can set up and then I have to start questioning, hold on a minute, I'm, I've just called this music for DIY, partly because that's become a slightly bigger umbrella term, you see, that's why I'm drawn to that. But in, personally, I've thought very carefully about this is actually more of a group thing rather than do it yourself. Uh, so anyway, these 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 uh, provocations, if you like, to uh, just just make uh, enable me to think more deeply about some of these issues. And you can engage with the provocations this afternoon in the workshop. <laughs> John, thanks a lot. Thank